so grateful, uh, uh, and, and hopefully you feel the same way, um, for a mom that read us the Bible again and again and again and again. And she was never discouraged by the fact that we most times never wanted to hear it. She just kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. And she always gives a, a, you know, a tribute to the church we grew up in. But I always tell her it was her faithfulness to teach us the word that made whatever church we attended, you know, that much, uh, 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 bring it that much more to life. So my mom's not here. Um, she's off living her best life somewhere. I'm not even sure where she is, but God bless her. Um, today, uh, I've been very excited about this, this passage, and um, it's one you may know if you don't know, but it, in uh, 2 Samuel 23, we read about David's mighty men. Do you know about David's mighty men? I mean, these are, this is like the boss group of, uh, of, of everybody in the Bible. Uh, any great movie of a gladiator, superhero, anything like that, I have to think that they had these guys in mind who were real characters. Now, remember, we're not, we're not reading poetry, right? These are actual stories about actual humans that did things. They weren't supernatural angels or something like that, um, We've just, we've, we've come so far from what God created us to be. Uh, outside of America, growing up in South Africa, hearing tales from America, you know, we'd always watch American movies and things like that. And, and you gave us uh, great examples like Rambo <laughs> and Commando and, uh, uh, you know, these things that we grew up with. Um, but uh, Americans to us were always such brave Incredible individuals. Uh, um, when when, when a, a tragedy was happening around the world, South Africa wasn't sending troops and uh, rescue efforts. It was always America. America was always on the ground doing things, setting up tents, running in when everyone else was running away. And uh, I, I, I think, you know, Satan has really gone after the courage of this nation. Um, obviously, with division, you know, comes a lot of problems. But people are so scared to even voice their opinion now in, in fear of retaliation. But I pray that God would once again, especially as Christians, that he would stir up courage in us. You know, some of the, the most brave people ever to walk this earth were those who believed in Jesus, who walked into areas where plagues were breaking out and they went in in order to tell people about Jesus and to pray for people, went into countries where it was almost certain death that they would lose their lives. It was Christians and yet, how are Christians portrayed in the movies today? They're always the weirdos, you know, and, and in the media and stuff like that. No, we should be uh, the kind of people that after someone spent time with us, they're like, I want to I wanna be more like them. Tell me what's your secret. And we can say, well, it's no secret really, but let me tell you about Jesus. Uh, so anyway, let me tell you about Benaiah, son of Jehoiada a valiant warrior from Kabzeel. He did many heroic deeds, which included killing two champions of Moab. And this is where we're going to camp today. Another time, on a snowy day, he chased down a lion into a pit and killed it. Huh. <laughs> Don't you love the Bible? He has this, this story about a man chasing a lion, and, 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 and it says, and it was a snowy day, because this is so important. Uh, but I think we can glean so much out of this one sentence uh, story. But this man went on to become the, the head of David's bodyguard uh, unit. I have no idea why. Anybody? The job application first uh, requirement was you must have killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. <laughs> and he was the only one to apply. <laughs> but uh, um, first we must understand uh, why he did this. But before that, I want to show you, we have a picture of Benaiah. We managed to get this, uh, which is... <laughs> I'm pretty sure if you showed up to David for the auditions for his mighty men, looking like that, they would have just killed you straight on the spot. <laughs> but this is what evolution has done, right? Now, this is a, he's obviously playing a movie character, so I'm not picking on an actual human being, but uh, uh, 
this represents a, a lot of what has happened in our culture today. Uh, uh, courage has been replaced by man bags, you know, and everything so, uh, uh, you know, gentle. You know, Jesus was gentle, but Jesus was powerful. Uh, uh, I'm not, Jesus was, was love. Uh, my friend Dwayne and I were talking about this the other day. Jesus was the perfect depiction of love. But he wasn't always nice. Right? I'm not sure, uh, we were having this discussion, I'm not sure we would like Paul or Jesus. We'd be like, oh, he's so rough. He's so mean. You know, he didn't, he didn't care about my feelings. Where's my man bag? Somebody's taking it. <laughs> you know, we have had the greatest d deposit ever on this planet inside of us, and that is the Holy Spirit. What better, what more could we ever ask for than the Spirit of God to be placed in us? And obviously, I'm using this for some humor and to make a point, but um, if you would go back, please, Sam, I don't think that's what Jesus had in mind. Now, obviously, I'm looking at a superficial thing, but you hear what I'm saying. I'm talking about the spiritual man that looks like that, that just so easy knocked off course and so easy run over and so easily giving up and so easily complaining and whining and why me and murmur, murmur. You hear what I'm saying? I'm so excited to teach this today, and I pray that something rises up in all of us because each of us are facing a line. Did you know that? And when that line's done, the good news is <laughs> you get another. Sometimes it's, 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 it's a whole flock of lions. Pride, pride of lions. <laughs> okay, let's read it again. Another time on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. Okay, we're going to break this down. Okay, why? Why did he do this? It wasn't so that he could stuff the lion and put it in his living room so when his friends came around, they could touch its ears and say, oh, the hair's so rough, right? It wasn't for that. It wasn't so he could prove his manhood. Scripture doesn't lead us to believe that. I believe just from historical context and, and, and yeah, you know, uh, coming from South Africa and knowing with tribes and all of that, uh, People lived in, in little villages, in little huts, in tents, in caves. And also we see that David killed a lion. Why? Who knows why David killed a lion? For Instagram. No. Why? <laughs> Sorry? It was a threat, it was a threat to, to his sheep, right? And the sheep represented their food source. So he killed the lion because it, it, it threatened their livelihood. The same with this lion would, would threaten uh, uh, somebody. And he knew if he did not go after this lion... What he let go today, somebody's going to face tomorrow. So now we know the reason why. This line represented danger. It represented a threat. It represented a problem, whatever it might be. Uh, uh, so on a snowy day, how many of you have spent time in the snow? Has everybody here seen snow? Now, if, if this was a South African audience, maybe two people would be raising their hands because we have no snow. And... Uh, uh, Maybe every 70 years it snows and, and um, just on the highways, enough to cause car accidents. <laughs> but uh, um, I had never seen snow, uh, you know, growing up. So the, so the first time we saw snow, it was so incredible. But one thing I noticed very quickly is you can't walk the same when there's snow as when there's no snow, especially crossing a road. You, you're going you're gonna to taste the pavement very quickly. And so if anybody knows, if, I don't know how many people have read When to Kill a Lion uh, book, but it says on the first chapter, don't do it in the snow. Okay, it's the worst time to try to kill a lion because you, you don't have solid footing. It's dangerous. It's risky. It's not ideal conditions. And there are too many believers waiting for ideal conditions before they're going to trust the Lord before they're going to step out, before they're going to take a chance, uh, all of these things. God has put something on your heart that you know you need to do, and you keep making excuses about the weather of life. Well, when I've got more money, then I'm going to be a blessing. 
Or when I, I, you know, I get to this, then I'm going to step out and trust God. Or then I'm going to share my faith. Or then I'm going to deal with this addiction or problem or whatever it is. We keep kicking the can down the road. And you want to know? You're going to get to the end of your life and the can is waiting still for you. Why did he go after this lion on a snowy day? Who knows? Who would like to take a, a, a random stab in the dark? Anybody? I had heard that the second service was much more intelligent than the first. <laughs> Prove me right. Why did he do it on a snowy day? Sorry? Because he, he could track it. Yes? What else? Come on, this is much easier than you think. Because it needed to be done. That was the day the lion was there. The lion did not come on the sunny day with 75 degrees right, and present itself on its back with its paws in the air. It was on this day, in the snow, the worst possible conditions to go after a lion. And sometimes in life, most times in life, we do not get opportunities gift-wrapped, handed to us in a nice way that we don't have to do anything except pop the bow. We have to take it as it comes, and most days it requires faith. You see, faith goes after something even when the, the conditions are not ideal. Um, if I can use uh, uh, an example from, from my life, uh, when we were living in Houston and, I, and just I started to see some conditions within my own heart and within my family. And for me, I started to identify a lion that needed to go. And my way of addressing this lion and dealing with this thing and taking the risk was to move my family out of the city and into the country. And let me tell you, conditions were not perfect. My daughter will tell you, she was not that happy, right? She was trying to have me replaced with another father. <laughs> but conditions were not perfect. Why? I had just resigned from my job, so I was unemployed. Not ideal conditions when you're about to step out and take a massive risk. The other thing is, it was in the middle of COVID. The other thing is, the place that we had bought had no toilets and no uh, water. It had no place to stay. We were going to be in a barn. These are not ideal conditions for launching out onto a new life. But the thing is, it wasn't my comfort that was at risk. There was something happening in my family and a line was there and we needed to go after the line and the, the conditions weren't ideal, but it still needed to be done. You hear what I'm saying? Maybe the Lord's been calling you out of a job and you're too nervous to let go because you need health care. Lord, I will follow you anywhere. I'll do anything, but you know, I need this. I need this 401k and I need this plan. I'm not talking about just randomly being reckless, but uh, when I read the Bible and it says, and Jesus sent them out two by two, he sent them out with nothing, like no retirement plan on earth, no money. This is a very different uh, 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 picture. But he sent them out as, as, as lambs among wolves. But yet we are the ones that have the power to make a difference, to drive back darkness because of the Holy Spirit in us. You with me? When people say to me, um, and this has happened many times of, of guests that have come, oh, you're living my dream. I want to shake them. And I want to say like, why am I living your dream? Why aren't you living your dream? You hear what I'm saying? And let me ask you this question today. Why aren't you living your dream? For those that maybe you're not. Why aren't you living your dream? And I believe the answer is, for the most part, it's because it's on the other side of something scary. It's on the other side of risk. It's on the other side of the unknown. It's on the other side of possible failure. Who's with me? If it was easy to achieve our dream, everyone would be living their dream. But here's why I believe that we are called to pursue something, even when conditions are not ideal, is because we grow, we develop, we are transformed. We change. I will use this example of uh, lottery winners. 
I, I don't watch many movies anymore, but I watch a lot of YouTube. And one of the things I like to watch is like the top 50 people who won the lottery and ruined their life. You know, something like that. In hopes that I can learn from their mistakes. Um, most people, 90% of people who, who win the lottery, and you know this stat, uh, it ends up being worse for their life than before. They end up losing everything and their life. They end up losing friends, marriages, whatever it might be. It was better that they never had it. I equate it to surfing. Winning the lottery, that amount of money is like a tsunami wave. But for the trained surfer, they love the tsunami wave. They can ride that thing and everything else. For the person who's going to the beach with their floaties, they're dead. So what's the difference? The surfer was ready for the wave. And in life, and I'm not just putting this as money, in life, God wants to take us somewhere. He's calling us to something, but there is a process to prepare us for that. So we're praying for something, and if God gave us that thing right now, it would destroy us. You with me? So trust the process. Trust the process of what God is doing. And people who grow up in a company and they've had to work from the mail room all the way through to CEOs, they're the best CEOs always. The one where the kid was just handed the CEO because the father was the CEO, usually that's the end of the company. It's like second generation wealth. Usually it doesn't go well. Because the first generation worked so hard, the second one just got it given, didn't pay the price to get there. What is your excuse that's holding you back from following what God has put in your heart? You don't have to tell me right now, but please put it in loop so we can all read it. <laughs> I believe that God has called us to live our dream. Not from a hedonistic, selfish thing, but it is God who puts those desires in our hearts. And when we don't achieve them, we are missing out what God had prepared for us and those around us who misses out. I will use Dina as an example. Who here enjoyed her singing today? Okay. And what if she didn't sing? You would have missed out on that encounter and that experience. And the same for your life. God has a song that he wants you to sing. But it comes just like Pastor Arthur asked you to sing. There's a choice of us stepping in and actually doing it. And it's risky. Right? I'm sure you had a, maybe a little bit of nervousness. Oh gosh, I wasn't prepared. And, and it's the same thing in life. What is holding you back from trusting God? And if it's failure, you've got to put that at the foot of the cross. Because if you are scared to fail, you will go nowhere and you will end up failing. Failing in being who God has called you to be. Amen? Okay, chased down. Chased, so he chased it down into the pit. Don't wait for things to fall in your lap. Chase it down by faith. I will give you an example. The, the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, she chased Jesus down. Excuse me, excuse me. Hey, you're not supposed to be here. Shh, forget you saw me. <laughs> These aren't the drones you're looking for. Right? What about the man who was paralyzed? His friends chased Jesus down. Took him on the roof, lowered him in. As Christians, too many people sitting on the couch complaining about what they don't have. When we have been given the greatest spirit, we've been given every opportunity, we've been given a Father in heaven who's so gracious, who picks us up, stands us up again, and yet we don't even get off the couch. Please. Don't look at anybody else and say that they are living your dream. Be inspired by people, but there is no reason for you not to live your dream. If Satan can't stop you from giving your heart to Jesus, from, from your soul being secure, he's going to make sure that your life is useless. And let me tell you about a useless life. It can look like this in a beautiful house. And there you are on the beautiful couch with a beautiful TV and watching every Netflix show. Useless life. 
Because it's, it's, the world's way is that I'm just about my happiness and my comfort and relaxing and all of those things. That is not who God has called us to be. Right? He has sent us out to bring light into the darkness. Do you know that Jesus said that we are the light to the world? I thought he's the light to the world. Yes, him in us. We are the light of the world. So what happens when our little Netflix butts don't get off the couch? There's no shining. And Satan loves it. You know what else he loves? When we are infighting in the church. Well, I think God's sovereign. Well, I think it's free will. Hey, we're both right. Let's go out and tell people about the love of Jesus. So, what are you waiting for before you start to chase these things down? Did you ever play on the monkey bars? And they're probably going to remove that because it's racist towards monkeys. <laughs> but did you ever play, you know those bars where you swing? Do you know that you can't progress forward without letting one go? And you can't chase down a line until you actually choose to go and do it. And you know what? It's risky. You might get scratched. You might get bitten. You might get bruised. But you are not waiting for something to happen in life. By faith, you are going after it. Paul said, I will show you my faith by my works. That's not achieving salvation. That's how we live out in life. Pastor Arthur said earlier, lay hands on the sick. That's a work. I believe Jesus can heal you. No. Lay your hands. Take a step. Take a chance. <gasps> well, what if they don't get healed? Well, what if they do? What does it matter? Take a chance. Into a pit. A pit is never a good place. And sometimes when we are chasing the thing that is in front of us, it's going to take us into a tough place place and that's okay sometimes in life it's going to seem like we're going backwards and that's okay because we're not on this american dream scale where we got to keep improving our car improving our house improving that that's what success of life no sometimes you're going to have no car and no couch and no house and it's okay because you are chasing something bigger and more important that's going to change generations because of the choice that you have made we had, uh, uh, it took us two years to build our dream house in Houston. It was everything my wife had ever dreamed of, right? She had a Pinterest wall like you had never seen. And we did it all. We held nothing back and we did that. And then we took a big step backwards. When, you know, in, in society's terms. We went from sleeping in our massive bedroom to she was sleeping on a, on a blow-up mattress with, with Geordie and Steph and Joshy was in a hammock with Brady in a barn. And I was sleeping in my car just so I could have some air conditioning. That was like the upgrade suite. <laughs> the presidential suite. <laughs> By society standards, we were taking a massive step backwards. But if you talk to my kids today, they will tell you they are in a far better place. If you talk to my wife She'll tell you she's in a far better place. So we had to sacrifice some things to go into that pit because there were things more important and it wasn't a big house. It was our hearts and our marriage and my relationship with the kiddos. You hear what I'm saying? You've got to know what's important. And just like he went into that pit, it was a risk. But he would rather die trying than let that lion run around and destroy people in his village. And I would rather die trying for my kids to know how valuable they are to me. That I would give up all of these things to put us as a family in a place where their hearts can flourish. You hear what I'm saying? You've got to know what's valuable. You've got to know what's important. And you've got to know what it's worth dying for. Because that will give you the courage to go in. I am at my bravest when I'm with my wife. Not because she's going to do anything, but she makes me brave because I would do anything for her. If there was a big guy causing nonsense, I'm not going to mess with that guy because scientifically I'm going to lose. But if there's a 
big guy and all his buddies, and they are messing with my wife, you, you must know, even though I'm going to lose, I'm going in swinging. You hear what I'm saying? I'm at my bravest when I'm with my wife. Why? Because her life means more to me than my own. As to so many first responders, firemen, police, all of this, that run in bravely on behalf of somebody else. I bet you on any day, the people who ran into the World Trade Centers to rescue others would have been terrified to do so and would never have done it. But because they heard that other people's lives were at risk, they ran in. And as believers, we have to live from that place. Our lives are secure. Did you know that? Nobody is snatching my life out of God's hands. So I can bravely run in where God is calling me to do whatever I need to do. And if I lose every earthly possession, guess what? I know a guy who owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. And I'm going to call him up through prayer and say, Father God, thank you. Give me my daily bread. Right? And we can go. Yes, days are nervous and days are tough and things like that. But what's at stake if I don't go after that lion? I don't know where my family would be right now. I would, I, I would only be able to surmise. But I don't think we would be in this place that we are now. My marriage is the best it's ever been. My, my, my boy makes me so proud and laugh every day. My daughter is flourishing in, in, in so many areas. But you know what? There was a time where I said, you know, during this whole transition, I was like, God, I think I, <laughs> I've messed up my family. It was so bad. There was tears and complaining and crying and, you know, my hip went out from sleeping in the car. Hey. But we went off to that line, and it's the next challenge and the next challenge and the next challenge. But we are developing and growing as we go. The last part is he killed it. He didn't just dance around the subject. There are some things in our lives that have to be killed. Right? You, you can't play, a, you wouldn't tolerate a, a venomous snake running around in your house, but yet we tolerate things that are absolutely venomous according to the Bible, and we think it's not going to have an effect. There are things that I rule a hard line in our house, and my kids will tell you. I'm like, I'm not even interested. We're not having this discussion. This is a hard no. Oh, but my friends, great. Their parents need to deal with them. In this house, this lion does not stand. And one day when they were parents, I was like, Dad, we didn't realize you were so amazing. <laughs> and I'm eagerly waiting that day. <laughs> um, Sam, will you put up the last slide, please? Listen to this. What you do not conquer, the next generation will face. And what you do conquer, the next generation will build on. I had to conquer some things from my previous generation. One of them was I had an incredibly abusive father. It was, it, that was something I had to overcome because my father never conquered that. And so I had to face that in my generation. That spirit of, of rage passed on to me. And so much so, and I've told you this before, that I actually called off my wedding because I was so scared that I would do that to her and I never wanted to be that person. And I had to go after that. And the Lord, he conquered that in my life. And if you ask my wife how many times she's had a beating, I mean, it's less than five for sure. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> but my wife lives in zero fear of me harming her. I had to conquer that. And so, you know what? My son, he doesn't have to conquer that. He gets to live and build higher and treat his wife even better because he didn't have to work to that level. He's building further. My daughter never has to wonder if her dad loves her. I had to conquer that. I had a father who told me, you're dead to me. My daughter has never heard those words. She's heard, I'm proud of you. You're amazing. So she can build higher. My mom... She, she was divorced, 
but she made sure to fight that lion in our lives. And both my brother and I are so happily married. So what are you passing on to the next generation? Are you passing something they can build on or passing something that they are going to have to fight themselves? You know what? Debt is not from God. It's not God's plan. Don't pass debt on to the next generation. There's this crazy concept. I don't know if you've ever heard about this. It's going to blow your mind. Spend less than you earn. (laughs) Dave Ramsey built a whole career of that one principle. Just spend less than you earn. And trust the Lord to bring the things around that need to, to happen. Credit card is this instant gratification. Instead of saying, Lord, if you want me to have this, I'm going to go after these things and you open the doors. And if not, I'm okay not having it. You hear what I'm saying? What are you passing on to the next generation? What are they going to have to face because you didn't want to conquer it? Let me tell you something about obesity. A child with one obese parent is 50% uh, chance that they will be obese. And with two parents obese, 80% chance. One alcoholic parent, 400% more likely to be an alcoholic themselves. And with two parents, even more so. There are days that I am so tired and I want to give up. We all have those feelings. And then I think about my family and I think about the platform that I'm building through the strength of God for them. And it gives me strength again. So if you can't conquer it for yourself, conquer it for your family. Conquer it for your friends. Conquer it for your neighbors. Conquer it for the people in your influence group that they know. I'm going to tell you something funny, but it's serious. I've had to conquer addiction in my life, right? I went to the AA and they rejected me because they said we don't deal with chocolate addiction here. But it was a real thing. Like, like, I could eat a huge slab like this, no problem. And I just loved chocolate. And everywhere we went, I'd eat chocolate and eat chocolate. And then, I, you know, I started to look like a chocolate. <laughs> but I can't tell my kids that they can overcome, that they can conquer, that they can rise above, that they can beat the lines in their life if they're watching their father unable to stop eating chocolate. That's a small example, but it's a big principle. And you know what? This is the longest run that I haven't eaten chocolate in a long time. It doesn't mean I won't ever have chocolate, but it's no longer has me. You hear what I'm saying? What about you? What are you passing on? And what are you building? What is the legacy that you're a lion slayer? Or are you the one who just watched the lion in the pit and said, And then somebody else is going to get mauled in a village because you didn't have the courage. You know where courage comes from? Courage comes from God, along with every other good thing. Ask him to fill you. Ask him to strengthen you. Repent for being fearful. It's okay to be nervous. But don't let fear hold you back. What an insult after all Jesus had done. And his spirit is in us. And man, that man was brave. Was there anybody more brave than Jesus? Knew he was going to be betrayed. Still went with it. Didn't hide. Said to the father, "Mm, is there any other option? No? Okay. Let's do it. I'm ready. And he did it. And he never wavered. Let us be the same way for our family. I want my kids to build on my foundation. You can see with uh, Pastor Arthur and Dina, whatever... Lions they've had to slay. Their kids are on a foundation to serve the Lord. You hear what I'm saying? That didn't happen by chance. They've had to fight something for their kids to love the Lord this much and to be in the ministry today. There are many kids that don't go to church at all because their parents were offended in church, stopped going to church, and so the kids fell away. If the father does not serve God in the household, Do you know, I can't remember the stats. My wife, maybe you remember. It's something like an 80% chance that the kids won't serve the Lord. The father, it doesn't say about the mother, 
for me, we had a, 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 a father mommy, a mommy who played both roles, who beat us like a man and loved us like a woman. <laughs> Amen. And let me tell you something about salvation. If you are here and you have not given your life to Jesus, if you don't overcome that doubt, that cynicism, that, that, that worry, whatever it might be, your kids are going to face it later. Be the one who kills the lion and then says, hey, kids, you can go out and play today. Dad took care of it. Amen. Amen. Pastor, will you pray for us?